Car of the Year, very simply, is the best of the best. It's it's the best cars of this year. And we always find, I think we like to find a different location, perhaps somewhere we don't normally go. And it's got to have the right roads and the, you know, it's got to be spectacular. And it, it always is. The Evo Car of the Year is a celebration it comes towards the end of the year. It's the only test where we have the whole Evo team out of the office on the photo shoot. We give ourselves five days to do it. And of course, we've got the best cars of the last 12 months. So it feels like a great way to celebrate everything that was good about the year. Evo Car of the Year is the time of year when all the cars that have impressed the magazine uh, over the past 12 months get it on basically, get, get to test each other's metal. That one time of the year where you've got the, the best cars that have been unveiled, um, all in one place. The snapshot of the cars at this point in time. Now, as soon as Ecoat is wrapped up, the most important thing is to find out when next year's one is happening. Because until you've got the dates, you, uh, you've got to keep the diary blank. No weddings, no babies, no holidays because you cannot miss out on this amazing event that we have every year. At the end of the day, we have to be confident that the verdict is the one that Evo is prepared to stand by for the rest of the year. That's why we go to the lengths of producing Ecoti every year. I hope that Ecoti over the following years will, will remain just as important and just as intriguing as this one because it was one of the best. first day of, of Evo Car of the Year, the first morning, it is a bit like being a kid at Christmas. You almost walk along the line of cars and, 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 and sort of say, oh, there's that, and then you're distracted by that, and then, but then you, 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 just, you see another one and you go over and look at that, and, and you, then it sort of dawns on you that you've, you've got the best part of a week, really, to, to, to live with these cars, to drive these cars, um, and just to, to soak it all up, and, and I don't think there's anything better better in the world than that really. It's just remarkable. I haven't done Yokoti for a couple of years and I have to make a comment that the standards have just leapt ahead over, over the space of 24 months. I think what this year has shown is how important the industry and the manufacturers take performance cars. They're never going to be big global sellers and they're, they're never going to be volume sellers but they're important halo cars to have and you just need to look at the, the standard and the quality of the cars we've got here. I don't think we've ever seen manufacturers indulge themselves in the pursuit of driving pleasure quite like they did in 2016. It's been a truly remarkable year. It was an interesting comparison between the BMW M2 and the Alfa Giulio Quadrifoglio because they're both rear-wheel drive, obviously, um, and both tipped to do very well, really. But the way they went down a road was surprisingly different. The M2 just never let you get into a flow. It was a lovely little car on the way out of corners, so easy to slide, and just felt a, a really nicely balanced thing, but you couldn't get into a rhythm with it because the suspension was so firm that it, it always felt like it was fighting itself. And, the wheel never felt sort of transparent in your hands down a bumpy bit of road, which was ultimately very frustrating and quite annoying. And the engine as well just didn't really, to be honest, it was totally forgettable. So once you stepped out of it, it was hard to remember exactly what it was like. The M2 reminded me why we bothered doing Car of the Year at all. When we've driven it in isolation, we've thought it was a fun, fast little thing, lots to like about it. But in the company of the very best performance cars of the last 12 months, it got shown up. So it doesn't have particularly good body control over a bumpy, cresting, undulating road. The body skips and hops and pogoes around. It feels as though it's trying to jump over the hedgerow, which is quite disconcerting when you're driving quickly. It's also got a fairly flat engine and the soundtrack isn't particularly spectacular. It's driving the car 
in the context of some really, really spectacular cars that reveals those flaws. Compare that to Alpha and the way that got down the road, which was particularly sort of noticeable with the uh, sort of, I suppose, the or the softer damper setting. So you could put it into its R mode and then set the dampers to its, their softer setting and it just soaked everything up and actually made it a wonderfully fluid process getting down the road still with a beautiful rear wheel drive balance. Perhaps the rear end wasn't quite as sort of faithful or precise as the BMW, but still lovely steering, an engine that uh, I thought really sang as it went through the revs. And a, a lovely surprise. I, th I hoped and thought it might do well when it came to UK roads, and it certainly proved to be, um, I think, one of the, the stars of UK 2016. The miserable weather that we had on the first two days of the test really allowed the four-wheel drive cars to shine. Um, the Focus RS was one of them, the Honda as well, and also the R8. I think it's a car that um, has a bit of a baggage of its own in that people think perhaps it's, it's not so special. It's, it is quite a, it's quite a button-down car in some ways, despite, its, despite the soundtrack. It makes a loud noise, but it's quite a sensible car in a lot of ways. It's so usable, so easy to drive. Um, it it's, has, a, has an incredible duality of personality, which, which I think can, can almost be um, interpreted as not being as exciting as some cars. But I know that I had some, some drives in that car, especially when the roads were wet, that were, were, were just amazing. It's a better car than the Lamborghini in lots of ways, um, but just didn't have the same sense of occasion. I think if you looked out of a bedroom window and saw the R8 on your driveway, it just wouldn't give you the same buzz that you would get from seeing the Hurricane. But still a fantastic car. And the engine is, well, it's every bit as exciting. One of the last great naturally aspirated engines in the world. Terrific uh, car to drive. I always judge cars based on two factors primarily, that's ability, that's how capable they are over a road, and the second one is character, that's just how much fun they are and how much you love them. Um, and the 911R for me scored highest on both counts, it's a fantastically capable sports car, but that engine, the way it looks, that manual gear shift, I think all of those things combined make it the most compelling package of any car of the lineup this year. It's the only car here that gives you a completely natural feeling of feedback from, from the road surface. To the extent that if, you, if, you, if you're not really going hammer and tongs, it just ease back slightly, hold the steering wheel more lightly, and the way the steering actually rides. You you could draw a map of, of the, the, the cambers and uh, of the road, and it's so beautiful. And it's also a car that seems to position itself um, well on the road. And it's and it's such a sensual experience uh, that uh, I felt in no other car here. So for Evo Car of the Year, you obviously want a fine, upstanding body of men, the best testers in the business. So we've added in, obviously, sort of our freelancers and staffers. And Dave Vivian this year had a pretty sort of commanding role. He's writing the main test in the magazine. And um, drove with him. Yeah, it's fair to say, absolutely to its limits. You spend almost a week with not only colleagues and mates, but real hardcore car enthusiasts and the f and the added pleasure of it is getting back to the hotel or bar or restaurant in the evening and just having a really good banter about what we've been doing during the day uh, and that's what cars are about they're not just bits of metal it's it's about the emotion of it and part of that is uh, talking about them with like-minded enthusiasts I think hot hatches and the like very much have their, their place in Evo Car of the Year and for me there's one overriding reason for that and, and that's the thrill of driving. A good hot hatch can give you just as much enjoyment, can be just as special in its own way as a supercar. I didn't really think things could get much better than the, um, the Renault R26R. You know, that for me was the, the, the hot hatch revelation of its, of its day. 
but um, I don't think I would have seen which way the golf meant. I mean, the golf is so fast across the ground and so enjoyable um, at the same time. We love a good hot hatch, and the standard these days is spectacularly high. I mean, the Focus RS, I think, is a brilliant car, and particularly the GTI Club Sport S. I mean, that thing is spectacular. There's as much dynamic ability, there's as much quality in that thing as you get from a Porsche 911 GT3 or a Cayman GT4. Sometimes you can have a drive in one of those cars and, and think, well, I, I couldn't have had that in, in anything else. And I think the Golf this year is a, is a great case in point for that because when, when you're driving that on the right road and you're totally immersed in that driving experience, you, you, you never once go, oh, I wish this was a hundred thousand pounds supercar. It's, it's a totally immersive experience and it's every bit as relevant to be there as anything else. The two hot hatches couldn't be more different in many ways. You've got one that's obviously all-wheel drive and the Focus RS um, and then you've got the front-wheel drive, sort of more traditional I suppose, club sport, yes, golf. The golf stamping uh, is just so exceptional. I just wouldn't have expected that from, from, a, from a hot hatch. I mean, it's the equal of any other car here. A couple of weeks before Ecosi, the Club Sport S hadn't even been, been on the shortlist. We, only a few of us had driven it. We'd won a group test and, and the guys came back saying this has to be included. So we managed to source a car and I'm really glad we did. It is a remarkable hot hatch. The Focus RS, on the other hand, is a car that's so exuberant I suppose and you have to grab it by the sort of neck despite having all this power and this four wheel drive system it's a proper hot hatch really, which I think people might not expect and I loved it for that I thought it was better for being on its uh, less extreme tyres here what's that to like about it it just it suited the roads I suppose as well because it's um, yeah a lot of the sort of rough and tumble up there it feels like a proper bit of rally car I suppose some of the other guys really hated the Focus RS and I can sort of understand why because it doesn't really set a very good first impression. The seating position is so high and it's pretty difficult to get over that actually. Um, the engine's pretty flat at the top end and if you drive it at medium speeds it feels numb, it feels heavy, it doesn't feel that exciting. I think though that when you really, really start to push that car hard, it comes to life. I think it gets up on its toes and it's really adjustable, it's really agile, really fast. I think the steering starts to work when you push it that hard. I love that when you turn it into a corner, the rear axle takes an attitude immediately, so it just feels really fluid and really lively through a corner. Uh, that's why I really, really like that car, much more so than many of the other drivers. It's incredible how cars can change in character um, according to, uh, according to the, the weather. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of one car here, and that's the M4 GTS. I first drove it in the wet on the Tuesday, and it was a bloody handful. It was actually really quite scary to drive quickly. I know people were thinking being a bit soft sound, but it's really aggressive, it's really spiky. Um, and on those Cup 2 tyres, the grip just disappears in an instant because the chassis is so stiff. I think it, it was starting off on, on the wrong foot, really, for it, and uh, it was quite low down in many people's lists. However, as the weather improved, uh, the roads dried out and we got onto some faster sections and it began to show what it could really do. You know, I love the polish and the suspension, I love the turning, I love the feeling you get when you can make it dance at relatively low speeds, and I love all the chirrups and squirts and chattering sound from the road and the gravel in the arches. The engine remains curious, but it no longer frustrates. The sound is like an M1 Pro car, but it has this turbo wallop at the higher revs. And I found myself slowly winding off the stability aids and ramping up the sport modes until I felt I could drive it very hard. And you know what? That was with some serious feedback. M4 GTS was just amazing as far as I'm concerned. It, it felt like a race car that had been tamed for the road rather than a standard M4 that had been tuned up to be like a race car. And you look at that splitter and the rear wing and the cage inside it and it, it gives you all that sort of excitement I suppose sort of to drive as well. There's such quality to the damping, it feels really, really good over a cresting and bumpy road. Um, so wet conditions, really, really hard work, but in the dry, yeah, it's a really, really good fun car.
I think a few of us worried that the Lamborghini might be the whipping boy of the group this year. Um, we haven't necessarily bonded with Hurricanes in the past, but actually it did fairly well. Um, I've got an issue with the car's steering. It's light, it's vague, it's really woolly, and it just kind of leaves you guessing where the front axle is, whereas the best cars here leave you in no doubt. Uh, it's also a shame that you can't switch the dampers back to a softer setting when the rest of the car is in coarser mode. It just means that if you want the most aggressive engine and gearbox combination, you've got to have the really solid dampers, and over a bumpy road, that just doesn't work. What I remember was just this stunning powertrain where you've got this fabulous V10. This sort of, I mean, it's, it's like the um, like they've taken the studio recording of the Audi R8, and that's the live version. It's just so raw and absolutely brilliant. But the rest of the car, for me, is is a bit of a letdown. I've always loved Lamborghinis, uh, and the older I get, the more I seem to like them. Uh, Everybody loves them. You drive one down the high street, small boys and small girls fall off the pavement looking at them. Amazingly, they uh, they get easier and easier to drive. Not more boring to drive, just uh, less stressful and uh, less intimidating, yet still uh, an incredible experience. The Mercedes was there because it won a group test a couple of months ago. Um, so it's, it's definitely a car that we really like here at Evo. Um, it's, it sounds fantastic. It's got a monster of an engine and it's really, really playful. It's really exciting to drive and you can slide the thing around like any AMG should be able to slide. C63S is, is one of those cars that you want to drive to Eco to and you drive back from after a week of hooning around in the mountains. It's got a lovely powertrain, that V8 and that gearbox are just beautifully synced and the chassis as well, it allows you to have, you know, it allows you to, to move around and to have a little bit of fun without um, lighting up the rear tyres everywhere, although it will do that easily as well. Um, it's just a lovely, lovely package but it didn't excite and where you kind of want excitement and that thrill of when you come across that road that you've already driven down in say the Alpha or or the Club Sport S and you, you've been really excited and really got into the drive and the C63 it it would go down at the same speed if not faster and it would do everything you needed it to do but you felt a bit disconnected from the experience. The variety of the roads that we had in Dumfries and Galloway and the variety in the weather that we had from very very wet to beautiful and dry, all offered a very stern test of the cars. We had smooth roads, we had bumpy roads, fast roads, slow roads. So if there were any cars that were only happy in a very specific set of circumstances, I'm thinking M4 GTS, they got shown up. Funny, the first time I drove the GTA, it was as soon as I got in and went up the road, I thought, the first thought was, this is what the new TVR should be like. The people working on the on these new TVRs really need to drive this car. So raw. And, and again, I drove that first in the wet, and it was extremely well behaved. Didn't feel particularly quick. Oddly though, the more I drove it, the less I liked it. The noise started to get pretty irritating. It is not quite like an F-Type, which is just sort of tinny and irritating, but just, just a bit over the top. The styling also is just not Aston Martin, and uh, well, it shouldn't make any difference, well, it doesn't make any difference to how it drives. Uh, it does affect you, you know, mentally when you look at the car. It just didn't really deliver the sort of punch that it that it promised. Didn't love it even the first time I drove it, but the more I drove it, the the less enamoured of it I was. I think a lot of people expect us to have a DB11 this year in Ecoti, but we chose the GT8 because it, it's it kind of is, is a sign off for Aston Martin of where they've where they've come from. The GT8 just sums up perfectly what we love about Aston today. It's it's raw, it's exciting, it sounds like thunder, every drive brings a smile to your face.
space and it's not the quickest it, it's not the most sophisticated um, but yeah it it's a car that if you knew was in your garage and you sort of open up that garage door every time you saw it you, you'd go for driving I think the real strengths of that McLaren are the way that they've applied their whole clinical thinking but purist thinking to, to the project it has the most incredible cockpit the ergonomics are amazing it feels such a mid-engine car it's very different to the r8 which doesn't actually feel that mid-engine when you sit in it i don't think but the mclaren is like sitting in a pod almost over the front wheels all you see out the front is road scenery and sky it's explosively fast explosively fast between six and eight thousand rpm it, it, it absolutely fries your brain i can't ever see that becoming the norm bit disappointed with the 570s um a lot of people raved about it uh still a really really impressive car but yeah i just found it a little bit uninvolving i like the clean styling inside and the simplicity of it but just a little bit too hygienic for me it wasn't very keen on the steering it's it's quite linear we go from lock to lock there's not an enormous, you know, it's not a great change in weight from one to the other. It didn't make it difficult to drive, it just, just didn't feel quite right. A really, really good car. I was just, I was just a bit underwhelmed by it, possibly because the 675 LT last year was, was just such a shock. Uh, it, it might have uh, got my hopes a bit too cranked up for the 570S. This is uh, the car I think that the first car tried to be but never quite was. Uh, the, the whole ethos of the NSX was a supercar that was friendly, easy to drive. Well, it was up to a point until it wasn't and it bit, bit back. Uh, lots of legendary stories of people um, thinking they were doing pretty well in an NSX and then they weren't. Uh, that would never ever happen in this car and if it did you would be travelling so quickly it's, um, it's hard to even imagine what the, uh, the result would be. For all of the NSX's brilliance, and we can't underestimate it, its brilliance and the performance that's on offer, it didn't reach my top three because I couldn't see myself going out at midnight to chase the particular thrill that it offers. The performance is, is such that you're into the territory of luck if something goes wrong, and, and I don't find that particularly comfortable. NSX was a really interesting car for me. First time I drove it, just did nothing for me. Looks, yeah, it, lo it looks pretty cool, but you, you get in it and it's a, a bland Japanese car interior. Does nothing for you. Driving along, it, it seemed to be a hybrid for the sake of it. it didn't really add anything to the occasion of the driving experience. But then, second time, longer drive, better roads, better condition, car starts to and you think, wow, oh, actually, there is something here and then the, the third and fourth time and every subsequent drive after that it it just blows you away just how fast it is how responsive it is um, but it's not all about speed there is some finesse to, to what it does and again it's one of those cars anyone of, of any ability can sort of get out of it what Honda has put into the car it's it's a remarkable package so there it is, Evo Car of the Year 2016, and I think it's going to be one of the more memorable ones just because the finishing order was so difficult to predict. The car that finished in 12th position, last position, was the BMW M2. It's far from a bad car, in fact there's a lot to like about it, but up against the best cars of the last 12 months, it just fell short. I think another surprise was the Aston Martin Vantage GT8, which was down in ninth position. And it's surprising because I think just about every judge jumped in it for the first time and thought, wow, this is an amazing car, this could be my winner. But throughout the week, it just sort of slipped down everybody's orders. It sets a good first impression, but it basically doesn't back that up with any more depth. It's just very noisy, not particularly fast, and I just think a standard N430 is a much sweeter car. The M4 GTS was baffling, really. Two judges loved it so much that they made it their winner, and two other judges disliked it so much that they had it down in ninth in their orders. 
I've never known a more divisive car than the M4 GTS. What a spectacular top three we've got this year, and such variety too. In third place, the McLaren 570S. I love that car. It's an extraordinary little supercar, and from a company that's just a few years old, what an achievement. The runner-up, a hot hatch of all things, the Golf GTI Club Sport S. What a giant killing performance that was beating the likes of the Honda NSX, the Audi R8 V10 Plus, the Lamborghini Huracan. What an exceptional little car that Golf is. But there could only be one winner, of course, and this year it's the Porsche 911R. What an exceptional sports car that is. Fast, fun to drive, exciting. It looks superb. Voted as the winner by five out of the seven judges. It is the 2016 Evo Car of the Year.